We'll, we'll see what that does. Okay. If you got anything, go ahead. Um, I just posted pictures of where I am at today. I've ordered some parts. Uh, 3.5 is in short supply, but Amazon did confirm my order. And I'll get it by the February 14. I also need more jumper wires because I'm going to breadboard everything as I go through um, processors and displays and radios. And then the, the idea is get the two uh, Raspberry Pis talking to each other with the Adafruit software. Um, this, my second Pi, I have to re reroute some of the wires because it has a um, smaller GPIO interface. So that means I have to designate another pin on that small uh, GPIO. And I've got it, I'm in the middle of doing that, but I have to wait for another, some more flashcards to go into the Pi and eventually for the 3.5. Um, I used, I posted uh, spreadsheets of the pin designations to help me kind of figure out what goes where. So um, the salmon colored one, um, I forget which, I don't want to switch between screens because I'll get lost, but um, where I've got the Pi interface to the um, radio bonnet, the salmon colored ones are uh, what I have to wire. So on the left side, yeah, on the left side, there's some salmon colored pins. And that's what I was led to believe that uh, Adafruit wants to use for the buttons. So when I get to the salmon color in the middle between the blue and the yellow, um, all those pins seem to match up. So I just have to decide which available um, GPIO pins I want to use for the buttons. Um, I've tried to be as, what, what's the word, verbose, um, and try and put everything that I, that I find, found out or discovered or what I have to change or whatever. But this is the only way I can remember what goes where and what works and what will not work. So I'm gonna follow this same um, pattern using spreadsheets to um, configure the 3.2 and eventually the 3.5. And it, it's gonna be a, a wire mess, but um, I think that's the only way I can uh, figure this stuff out. So like on here, um, like, like what you told me, the, there's two kinds of pin numbers. One is a board pin, that's the physical location uh, of a place for a pin. And then there's a logic or a, a analog digital port um, assigned to it. Um, I like to call it a, a, a logic pin number, but I think Ada or other people call it the DIN point pin number. Um, whatever I find, going through this development process, then I'll put it on my spreadsheet. So I think I have your uh, example assigned to the correct pins. Um, you have to excuse the, the lack of boxes. I was messing around and I haven't quite figured out how to get back to um, the boxes showing up better than what they are. But I think basically, is this what you did with your Teensy and your your small radio board? Well, no, actually, the chart that I was making up is what I was going to do for my new one. 
Oh, and, okay. And I see that uh, what I have here is not going to work right out of the box. I, I, because oh. when I when I posted this, I was saying that I'm not sure exactly where to hook these up. And I see oh. this this chart says uh, for the radio, it says D out, Mosey radio, DN, Mesa radio, and chip select. And I've got those on pins, what, seven, eight, and nine. And it turns out that's the secondary SPI port. And I found that oh. the, the link I posted on the, the, last, the last meeting to where somebody was saying, which pins do I use? And they confirm that you want to use the, if you don't want to change anything, you want to use the standard uh, SPI port. Okay. So you, you want to use, what is it, pins uh, like 11, 12, and 13 instead of 7, 8, and 9, I believe, for those pins. And then as far as, as far as the other pins to use, if you pull up the example code, uh, say if you go to the TNC and say, load up the uh, Arduino data, for these radios and look at the code, it'll say uncomment one of these blocks of code depending on the type of board you have. So you, okay. go, down the, you go down the line that says TNC 3.2 and uncomment that, and it already has three pins listed there that they're suggesting that you use. So I would say for, for the moment, just, just to get the radio to talk, you know, just hook up right. the six, six wires for the radio plus the power and ground and okay. load up the code and see if you can get the radio to talk, you know, and, okay. and, and don't worry about the rest of the stuff right at the moment. Get that to the point where you know the radio is talking and moving data back and forth. Once okay. you get to that point, because at that point, with your USB cable connected to your Arduino, you can pull up the serial monitor. And if you've got, uh, if you're sending a message from your Pi, it will, you, you can have it printed out that USB port and see it on the screen. So whatever you put out from the Pi should show up on the screen for the for the radio that's connected to your Teensy. Okay, good. So so get that working first, and then you can start worrying about you know all the other stuff that you want to hook up to it. Yeah. Okay. Good. And, and as I say, this chart that I posted was kind of an afterthought. I just kind of uh, quickly whipped it up and stuck it on there. And it, the, the whole point, it was the example of, you know, build a chart that shows all the pins on your board and right. then take the ones you need to have and write them down. But a per, yep. uh, but but the ones I've got written down here uh, are not necessarily going to work right out of the box. If you want to use the default example software they give you, you have to use the, the default SPI port, not the auxiliary okay. one, which I used here. The, okay, only, do the only drawback to that is the pin 13, which goes to your LED on the board, they're using that. They're going to be using that as your, I think it's your SPI clock, which means that light is going to flicker as the thing, as the thing tries to talk. And also don't go into your code and say, assign pin 13 and try writing to it, because that's going to pre prevent your radio from working. Oh, so, okay. So, so don't try to use the onboard LED. Let it, let it take over that and go ahead and use it. Good. Um, maybe I'll do like what you did and put a parallel and bring that out to the control panel so I can see what's going on. Do a, um, do what? Oh, the LED. Yeah, you could you yeah. can pick any pin on the the Teensy and run it to an LED. That you know you you've got full control over that. I'm just saying that if you oh. follow their example, don't use the onboard LED because they're already using it for something else. Okay. Um, just one other note on my um, tractor control panel. There's a hole or two holes on the right hand side of it. Um, and that's for expansion. Um, yeah, there it is. And my thinking is I could implement um, that simplified switchover between manual and computer like what you have done rather than messing with all my other toggles and this and that but that's that's down the road um and i think i've still got enough display area potential display area on the panel i can do something with either a radio display or a small um touch screen or something i don't know that's up in the air this the box in the upper right that's actually my 12 to 24 volt step up regulator 
Um, I think I got a picture where the lid is up. Um, and I can choose with the red buttons on what message to display, whether I could see the just the 12 volts coming in or just the 24 volts going out or switch between both of them. Um, the little blue pots, this is a regulated supply. So um, I can fine tune that voltage. I did this because um, I'm concerned if I overload the motors for some reason, um, I need to shut it down in a hurry. So if I see voltage drop or something, I'll, I'll notice that there's a problem. The other thing is I didn't know, or I don't know how much current these motors are gonna take. Um, so that's why I wanna display is um, over everything. Uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, the red buttons can, can select um, the input or the output or a combination of both and flash. Yeah. And it sets, um, those are the paths for adjusting the voltage, um, both in and out. Um, let's see, that's about it. it it's kind of weird, the incoming voltage, 12 volts is coming from the left side and the outgoing voltage is on the right side. So it's kind of a mess inside the box for wiring and it's not nice and neat. It would have been better if it was just reverse, but I can do what do what I got to do. So that's that's working. Um, what, what did you use for that window on top? Is that just a plastic box that you've cut down? Yeah, um, it's. I think it's uh, a box from um, earplugs, an empty box. We use the earplugs for sleeping, and we use it. Uh, my wife uses a wax type and that's the box that they come in. I've got one more that I can use and I'm, I haven't decided yet. Um, I do have a Raspberry Pi touch screen. Um, if you can, I'll show you the box if you can switch the camera. Um. Okay. Um, that it, it's reversed, but it's a touch screen TFT. But the problem is that it's set up for Raspberry Pi, which is 40 pin. So on the back, it looks like this. It's got a you know, 40 across the top and then a, another one down here. So thickness wise, um, it might be some problems if I get too cramped. Um, that's all soldered in and I can't pull them out. But it's nice, it's got some tabs on it for mounting. So in theory, maybe I can mount this underneath a cutout on the panel and then put some kind of protection over the top of it and then maybe wire. I don't know, that's just a, a pie in the sky idea I got. And is that is that a touch display? Yes, it is. So you may it's, have a problem putting something over the top at your touch screen may not uh -oh. work at that point. Okay, so I'll have to put a lid on it. Yeah, it's um, Adafruit, a 480 by 320, three and a half inch TFT plus touch screen for Raspberry Pi. It works the best with uh, model A plus, B plus, and Pi 2. So I'm wondering if I can uh, change the wiring over to, uh, to uh, and patch it in to the 3.5. But uh, again, that's, that's uh, way down the road. And I just had this sitting around. I didn't order it recently. So I might want to do that. Well, I think it's, that'd be a lot of, take a lot of horsepower on your teensy to generate graphics and stuff to put on that display. So it, oh, it okay. may just want to use that on a, a Pi. Oh, okay. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm running out of room. 
in my box. <laughs> the old too small a box trick. Okay. I need a bigger box. But I've got the uh, my two motor controllers. So I got four channels, a motor control. And I've got a small space right over here. And I have to figure out how to get these wires up out of the way. So I'm really pushing the limit on how much uh, footprint I have to work with. Uh, but also I've got, I, have, I don't have, uh, everything is hardwired right now. And I'm shopping around for maybe a, some kind of connector that would allow me to pull the wires out and get access. But most of the bulkhead um, sockets, you know, they tie you right to, right to that case. And I need to pull that off. So if I do get a bulkhead, I don't know whether I can mount it on the inside and have enough threads on the outside to screw it um, tight, but um, I'm going to have to work on that idea. But right now, everything is just hardwired from the control panel directly to the motors. Um, and of course, the maybe years down the road, I'll, I'll do a um, revision number three and get away move away from all the switches and complications with the wires and stuff like that. But right now it's, I'm teaching myself starting with the manual and, and the manual switches and measuring response times, and then eventually go over to um, uh, computer assisted kind of stuff. So that's, um, oh, on my, my, uh, board, my experimental board, the, the white one, where I have the two pies duct taped down. Um, I brought out the, the GPIO on the second pie. So it's literally the, I think it's the upper bank goes to the left and the lower bank goes to the right. And then I printed out um, a, a copy what the pins um, represent. Yeah, there, yeah, right there uh, above that pie. So the upper, the upper bank goes to the left and the lower bank of the connector goes to the right. And then I've got the, the radio, the, um, the bonnet standing free and clear, but wired to the, the breadboard. So now um, I can put jumpers between, since they are isolated, I can experiment and make sure I get the wiring correct by putting jumpers between the two circuits and be as safe as possible. And I like that idea and I wanna continue this idea when I start using the 3.2 and the 3.5. That's why I did the, the T boards like they are. Um, this allows me to switch the, the radio between the different boards when I'm testing. That way I can start with uh, my first radio, um, my Pi 3, which has a radio on it, that would be like a base or reference as I experiment with these other processors. Um, I like the Adafruit because I, I can, it's well documented, I can understand it. And I think I can um, change pin designations and have the, the pies working. That's more important. Then I, I can, I'll start off with trying to get a, a 3.2 to talk to this pie that you have uh, on the screen, the one on the right with the duct tape in the corner. 
because that'll be a, a known good system. And then the 3.2, I can troubleshoot and figure out what I'm doing wrong. And then eventually um, that 3.2 would be a remote control um, portable. I haven't figured out how to do it yet, but that's the way it's gonna go. And then the 3.5 would be in the control box with a radio attached to it. Um, and that's gonna take quite a bit of rewiring or re reformatting or whatever it's gonna take. So I've got enough um, project material to keep me busy for quite a while here because I'm, um, I'm still understanding what I can change, what I can't. And uh, that's, that's about it. But I'll, I like the, the spreadsheet and the different colors I can use to assign to a particular area, like trying to wire from one computer to the next one. Um, a couple of comments. On, a couple of comments in your antenna connector. I see right there in the picture your antenna is not plugged in. Some right. people, some people will tell you 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 must have an antenna plugged in, or you may burn out your radio. And then yep. other people say, well, they're low powered radio, so it doesn't matter one way or the other. So it, it's probably a good idea to have that plugged in if you're going to be using the board. And the other point right. is the little UFL connectors they claim. I zoom in on this more. They claim those are only good for for uh, connecting about thirty times. They're not they're not a real sturdy connector. So you don't don't be connected and disconnected three or four times a day because those are going to go go bad on you. What's the other okay. end, what's the other end of that look like? Is it at the other end? Is that screwed onto the an antenna? So so at yeah. some point you could replace the cable. You could just replace the cable and that gives you the new little connector on the end. Right. So just unscrew yep. it from the antenna and put it on there. And then, yep. so so it could be if you do need to keep disconnecting things, hook up the UFL connector, and maybe even put a uh, like a tie wrap or piece of wire right here through this mounting hole to keep that wire from from wiggling around, so you don't put extra stress on it. And then if you you need to do it, then just unscrew the antenna from it. You got the little connector there. You can put through holes or whatever you got to do with it. So that that that's one way to keep from having to connect and disconnect the little connectors a lot. Okay, good. And I was surprised when when I looked at that, that, that it actually came with that connector soldered on. That, that, that's a real pain to solder those little tiny connectors onto the onto that board there. And uh -huh. probably, I, I, I haven't actually tried that. It might not be that high, hard to solder on, but I was complaining last time about trying to solder on the SMA connectors, which uh, I was able to get a couple of them soldered on, but I was I was lucky too, so I... I probably won't do that again unless I unless I really need to. So, okay. So I think that's that's about where I'm at right now. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for. Uh, I ordered two more cards. Um, about a hundred female to female patch cords, and the three point five. And some other things I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, that's where I'm going so far. Uh, on your radio, it, it says it has some extra GPIO pins on that. It's like they label them one through five or zero through five. And it turns out GPI, GPIO zero is actually the interrupt line. So you have to use that anyway, but then it's got those oh. other other uh, pins on there, and you don't have to connect those back to your computer. Those are simply extra I/O pins if you need them for something. So oh, okay. but you don't you don't have to go you don't have to actually hook those up to either your, your Pi or your TNC or whatever. Okay, good. So I just have to worry about six wires instead of the what nine or ten or whatever I got right now. Yeah, there there there's the basic six wires to make the radio work plus power yep. and ground. And once you yep. get that hooked up, it should it should work. You don't have to hook up the rest of the stuff. And I okay. think your dis display is simply two lines. You've got the SDA and SCL to make the display work. So that's two more wires. And if you want the push buttons, that's just you know one wire per push button to hook them up, hook them up wherever you want on to. The, on the display, it just requires two 
two wires, but um, how does it get power? It's the, the, the board itself. When you put power on that board, it powers your radio and the display and maybe oh. some, something for the push buttons or whatever. It, it's just got common power on this. Oh, okay. So once you power up the board, you know, to, to use the radio, the display is already powered up. Oh, okay. Have you played with that display on the Teensy to see if you can get that to uh, no, do anything? No, uh, I need more wires to, to interface it safely. I assume if you just go to Adafruit and look for a sample code for that display, you, know, right. you, you can just load that and play with the display and then later you'll, you'll have to merge that in with your radio code to get them both to work at the same time. Yep. But I, I assume um, they just have some sample code you can just load up and it'll work. Right. So um, it's going to be quite a learning curve on how to um, design and implement the, the radio packets themselves to get the messages across that I want. Um, I did find uh, an article where two college kids did something for the Forest Service, and they showed an example of uh, how to assign things to a packet. But it was custom for the Forestry Service, so it if it seems like it's pretty flexible, and but you just have to be careful how many bits you're using, and and keep it to a certain amount. Yeah, I found these radios aren't as fast as they ex expected them to be. I, I figured you'd set it up and you'll send a thousand packets per second, but it, yeah, I'm getting like 10 packets per second, I think. I just have in my, my transmit side, I just have a loop that says read all the data, send it out, wait for a response, and then just put a short delay. And it turns out I can get that delay quite short and it still doesn't transmit very fast. So it's okay. But that's but it, it seems seems to do what it needs to for, you know, as far as remote control. So yeah, the main thing is to just get it to shut the motors off in case of an emergency and then maybe be able to uh, operate the tractor a little bit at slow speed, just uh, like maybe snow blowing the driveway where I can actually see it from the house. Um, but I'm a long ways from that. Yeah, and once you get that far, there's lots of experimentation, lots of different things you can do with it. So, but you know, yeah, but first of all, I get the radios talking so you can send stuff back and forth, and then you, then you can decide, you know, what what information do you want to send and and go from there. Yeah, it sounds pretty good so far. Um, have you got anything? What you've been working on? Uh, basically nothing. The, the only thing I did was uh, I got. I, I, I've soldered pins on one of the radios and stuck that and a teensy on a, a board and that. So I just need to okay. run the six wires between them and the power it leads to, to get it to do something. And that's, that's, that's really all I've gotten done. Okay. So is Al going to change hardware and, and go to Adafruit? I mean, go to uh, Arduinos? Uh, for... he, he said he's going to, and we'll we'll see where he gets on that. The, the problem is he, he can't get the, he's using a program called Platform IO to program his boards. So he's got a, a Raspberry Pi on his vehicle, and then all of his little teensies are plugged into that over USB. And he wants to be able to say from his desk, he says, send the software to the thing and reprogram the boards because his boards are buried down inside of everything. So he wants to be able to do it uh, over, over the error programming. And it turns out um, wh when they came out the, the newer version of platform IO it's for the newer operating systems that all use Python 3.x something. And yep. his, his is still using Python 2.7 and they don't, they don't play together. And I did find a website, which I posted that I think it says, here's how you fix that and it will work. But instead he just, he's going to throw out his teensies completely and use Arduinos because they will, I, I, he should, he should try it first because uh, just because he thinks it works with Arduinos, he may have the same problem if he tried to load platform IO it, it's, it, it's the problem with the software. It's not the problem with his boards themselves. Okay. Now, the other thing is he was going to use the uh, 
I think it was the the Arduino has a command line interface. So instead of pulling up the full IDE and everything, you can go to the command line and say, program the board on this channel, and it will do that for you. So that might be his reasoning that he wants to use the Arduino boards and then well, use the command line interface to talk okay. to him. And that may not may not be an issue with this Python at that point. Okay. Well, that's worth looking into. As far as I'm concerned from, from my setup, um, I wouldn't be running Raspberry Pi on the tractor. It'll be the 3.5. But um, and then probably have to go to more 3.2s for lower level stuff, like any sensors or whatever. Yeah, a lot of that stuff you you can combine onto a single processor, but sometimes it's easier because you just have you know if you have a a processor dedicated to whatever you're doing. That way you just got the code for that thing and you're not trying to merge all these different okay. uh, types of sensors and code. So that 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 was Al's reasoning. That's why he's got he's got four or five, I think Teensy 3.2s on his stuff. And that's oh. that's part of part of the reason he did that. The other reason is when he was using those uh, magnetic uh, encoders to read his wheel position and his steering position. It turns out you can't run the I squared C lines very far in a noisy environment. And on his lawn tractor, he's got noisy environment from his spark plug and his uh, alternator and all kinds of things like that. And if you have relays and stuff. So he ended up putting the sensor right next to a teensy. And that way there, there's not enough noise to script the communication. And then he just runs a USB cable back to, oh. he's got a USB hub where everything combines it together. Okay. So there are just different ways to do it. And on mine, I just have a bigger processor. Um, I, I, it's, anyway, what, it's that. 30. That's, uh, yeah, S, ST Micro 32F4. And it's, it, it looks like that. It's got lots of, lots of junk oh. on it. And uh, then, then one. Someone had given him a project that was based on this type of board, but he couldn't buy the board, so he bought the other. Uh... Well, if I can clean off my desk, it'd be easier to find all this stuff. <laughs> anyway, it's a board that has that processor on without all the extra junk, and that's what that's what he wants to use on it. Oh, here's one here. So basically, it's just a. Oh, okay. It's it's a smaller. Smaller board's got just the processor. I think there's a flash memory on it. And then there's a uh, SD flash card socket. And okay. that's uh, that's basically all that's on that board. So you don't have all that extra stuff in your way. Because on this board that I've got, it, it has lots of extra junk on there because it was a, a demonstration board. It has some kind of a fancy audio uh, processor that generates, you know, you can hook it up and get fancy stereo audio out of it, which I don't need. And things like that just get in the way. Uh, but the point is, on mine, I've got a so I've got a single processor that's doing uh, a lot of the things on there. But then, if I wanted to add some sensors, for instance, I added uh, an IMU module, and I've got a separate Teensy 3.2 to do that. So that's a separate processor. Then I added a second IMU on there, so I've got two Teensies and two IMUs. And then I wanted to be able to measure my steering position, and the quickest way. I soldered a wire onto the pot on the R on the RC servo and connected it to a uh, uh, Arduino Nano. So it's I, I just wanted the five volt processor and I didn't really care about resolution. I just wanted to verify if that would give me a decent signal. And it does appear to do that. So I could combine these things back onto my main microcontroller or the, the IMUs, I would probably keep those separate. Again, it's like Al's problem where if you get those I squared C connections too long, you're gonna have problems. So right now it's it's fairly handy to have the, the Teensy and the IMU connected together right on the same board. And then, let's see if I had, when I, I, again, I put that board away. So I, I just had the, the 3.2 in a, in, a, in a IMU on the same board and that just plugs in over USB. So okay. part of that depends on where you want it to go. Do you want the signal to go back to your ROS computer? If so, then you can use the USB. If you want it to go to my, my microcontroller board that I have, then I'd have to hook up like a UART interface or something between those, which is not a big deal. It's just that one more thing you have to 
figure out and make it happen? Um, one of the, a couple of reasons why I chose a 3.5 is there are multiple SBIs and I squared C's and it has a temperature and I can put a, a clock battery on it. So it preserves the time. Um, but I'm wondering if I'm expecting too much if I start hooking up the 3.5 to very much um, displays or whatever. I'm just worried that that, that I'll bog down 3.5. So maybe I should use more 3.2s for to hand off to. Well, it really just depends on what you're connecting to it. So if you get some kind of display, a lot of the displays have built-in controllers. You know, if you just a simple, say a simple LCD display, you know, you, you basically send out a couple of commands saying, write this text at this address. And that doesn't take much on the processor. But that display you held up that was for a Raspberry Pi, you may actually have to generate video to put on that display. I don't remember how those work. I don't remember yeah, if it's... Uh, I don't, I don't need it. I don't know if they have an SPI interface and you have to shift out, you know, three three million bits to make the screen work or or how that works. But but okay. again, again, if you buy the correct display, like say you've got that little OLED display, that doesn't take a lot of extra horsepower to run that. You just have to say it probably has commands like uh, set the cursor here and write this text. They probably have libraries to do all that. But okay. I, I think you write to it once and it stays there. You don't have to constantly keep refreshing it. So a part okay. of it is just a matter of picking the correct peripheral that doesn't take a lot of extra extra work okay. to make, make it go. Okay, now on the Raspberry Pi, I've got the um, HDMI connector. And I think on one of them, it's got a video connector. Um, so I'm wondering if I could get both of those Pi's or multiple uh, processors up on one screen somehow. There is a switch, HDMI switch, I can switch between one Pi or the other, but it would be nice if I could see both of them at the same time on one monitor. If I can't, then I gotta think about using a, a second monitor and um, really can't afford that. I've got a broken TV I could use, but um, pretty soon the, my displays will be bigger than the table I'm working on. And um, I don't know if it's worth it. Well, the other option is you can fire up both Raspberry Pis laid on the table with no displays and then take a computer and log into both of them. So you, you open it one screen for the first Raspberry Pi, a second screen for the second Raspberry Pi. And if you're, if you're just displaying text, you know, the command line stuff that works, you, you can right. open those screens, that'll work quite well. If you want to see the full desktop, you, you'd have to play with that and see if you can get multiple Raspberry Pi desktops opened on another computer. You, you might okay. be able to do that. There, there'd be, be absolutely no reason why you can't do that. And that way you can do it all from one computer screen. So you just simply have to click on the, the window of which one you want to see or try to get them all to show up at the same time. But that, that's so another option. So I could um, use my laptop and use USB to plug the pies in. And like you say, call up one screen or call up two screens. Well, you probably want to use your laptop and Ethernet. I saw you had Ethernet cables plugged into the stuff. So, yeah. so to talk to it, you probably want to talk to it over Ethernet or uh, your your bigger Pi that you had, the newer Pi, it might have Wi-Fi, so you could actually connect over Wi-Fi if you really wanted to. But if you've got Ethernet connected to them anyway, and your laptop can talk to it over Ethernet, which maybe is going to go through Wi-Fi or whatever, but but okay, but but that that's how you communicate with them. You use it's the Ethernet type type interface, not the USB. Okay, that's good to know. It's so looks like I've got quite a bit of work to do yet before I can report any success on anything. <laughs> it's going to be a couple of weeks. Well, speaking of the board that has a video interface, let me pull one of those out. I see it also, it, it, it's, it's the original Pi, Pi B, and I see it does have an HDMI connector and the video connector. So yeah, you can, you can use either to hook up to a monitor. So if you have a television, an old television that has a, a video input, yeah, you can just plug in the video cable and view it. it. 
you may have to make your text quite big because TVs are not not meant to display high resolution text and graphics. So I think that's I think that's your board is the exact same one as I'm using on yeah, the, on the hand I side. I believe it is. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And I've got enough card adapters so I can still use the small cards and plug into the the larger adapter. So, yeah, let's. I'm I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable. I, at first, it was all of this was very overwhelming, and just have to more time on task. Is, so I'm getting there. Yeah, and just playing with one at a time until you figure it out is 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 a fairly good approach. And then as you say, when you're going to go the two radios on two pies, yeah, you can hook up all those jumpers, and that way you you figure out you know which wires you have to hook up. Because the one board on your your newer pie, you just simply plug it in, everything's all hooked up for you. So now you have to kind of unravel that and figure out which wires have to be connected on between your pie and your board. And you, you, seem, you seem to have a good handle on that. You've got that little um, interface board in between so you can just put jumpers in there to hook them up, so. Okay, that's good. How are we doing on time? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> it, it Usually when you're doing this, it'll pop up and say, oh, we're gonna cancel your meeting in 10 minutes and I haven't seen that oh. pop up, so. So they'll, they'll shut you down before they start charging. Yeah, they, as far as I know, they won't charge me at all. It'll just simply, I think it'll just abruptly end and then it'll be the end of it, so. Oh, okay. And I guess I don't have anything other than, you know, answering questions, so. Yeah, well, this has been very helpful. So thanks again. Yep. So, so here, let me, talk let, let, me, let me stop the recording.